Jewish feminism is a movement that seeks to make the religious, legal, and social status of Jewish women equal to that of Jewish men in Judaism. Feminist movements, with varying approaches and successes, have opened up within all major branches of the Jewish religion. In its modern form, the Jewish feminist movement can be traced to the early 1970s in the United States. According to Judith Plaskow, the main grievances of early Jewish feminists were women's exclusion from the all-male prayer group or minyan, women's exemption from positive time-bound mitzvah mitzvah meaning the 613 commandments given in the Torah at Mount Sinai and the seven rabbinic commandments instituted later, for a total of 620, and women's inability to function as witnesses and to initiate divorce in Jewish religious courts. According to historian Paula Hyman, two articles published in the 1970s were trailblazers in analyzing the status of Jewish women using feminism. The Unfreedom of Jewish Women, published in 1970 in The Jewish Spectator by its editor, Trude Weiss Rosmarin, and an article by Rachel Adler, then an Orthodox Jew and currently a professor at the Reform Seminary Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, called The Jew Who Wasn't There, Halacha and the Jewish Woman, published in 1971 in Davka. Also, in 1973, the first American National Jewish Women's Conference was held in New York City. Blue Greenberg gave its opening address. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Jewish feminist theology. Various versions of feminist theology exist within the Jewish community. Some of these theologies promote the idea that it is important to have a feminine characterization of God, and or more feminist language in general, within the Siddur Jewish prayer book and service. In 1946, the new Silverman Siddur of conservative Judaism changed the traditional words of thanking God for not making me a woman, instead using words thanking God for making me a free person. In 1976, Rita Gross published the article female God language in a Jewish context." Davka Magazine 17, which Jewish scholar and feminist Judith Plaskow considers, "...probably the first article to deal theoretically with the issue of female God language in a Jewish context." Gross was Jewish herself at this time. Reconstructionist Rabbi Rebecca Alpert Reform Judaism, Winter 1991 comments, the experience of praying with Siddur Nashim the first Sabbath prayer book to refer to God using female pronouns and imagery transformed my relationship with God. For the first time, I understood what it meant to be made in God's image. To think of God as a woman like myself, to see her as both powerful and nurturing, to see her image with a woman's body, with womb, with breasts, this was an experience of ultimate significance. Was this the relationship that men have had with God for all these millennia? How wonderful to gain access to those feelings and perceptions. Siddur Nashim was self-published in 1976 by Naomi Janowitz and Margaret Venick. In 1990 Rabbi Margaret Venick wrote the sermon, God is a woman and she is growing older, which as of 2011 has been published ten times, three times in German, and preached by rabbis from Australia to California. Rabbi Paula Reimers, Feminism, Judaism, and God the Mother. Conservative Judaism 46 1993 comments Those who want to use God, she language want to affirm womanhood and the feminine aspect of the deity. They do this by emphasizing that which most clearly distinguishes the female experience from the male. A male or female deity can create through speech or through action, but the metaphor for creation which is uniquely feminine is birth. Once God is called female, then, the metaphor of birth and the identification of the deity with nature and its processes become inevitable. Ahuva Zash affirms that using both masculine and feminine language for God can be a positive thing, but reminds her Reform Jewish readership that God is beyond gender is God male, female, both or neither. How should we phrase our prayers in response to God's gender? In the Union for Reform Judaism's A Torah, 7. Feminine imagery of God does not in any way threaten Judaism. On the contrary, it enhances the Jewish understanding of God, which should not be limited to masculine metaphors. All language that humans use to describe God is only a metaphor. Using masculine and feminine metaphors for God is one way to remind ourselves that gendered descriptions of God are just metaphors. God is beyond gender. These views are highly controversial even within liberal Jewish movements. Orthodox Jews and many conservative Jews 
hold that it is wrong to use English female pronouns for God, viewing such usage as an intrusion of modern feminist ideology into Jewish tradition. Liberal prayer books tend increasingly to also avoid male specific words and pronouns, seeking that all references to God in translations be made in gender neutral language. For example, the UK liberal movement's Siddur Lev Chadash does so, as does the UK reform movement's Forms of Prayer 2008. In Mishkan Tefillah, the American Reform Jewish Prayer Book released in 2007, references to God as He have been removed, and whenever Jewish patriarchs are named Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so also are the matriarchs Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. In 2015, the Reform Jewish High Holy Days Prayer Book Mishkan Hanefish was released. It is intended as a companion to Mishkan Tefillah. It includes a version of the High Holy Days Prayer Avenue Malkinu that refers to God as both loving father and compassionate mother. Other notable changes are replacing a line from the Reform Movement's earlier prayer book, Gates of Repentance, that mentioned the joy of a bride and groom specifically, with the line, Rejoicing with couples under the huppa wedding canopy, and adding a third, non-gendered option to the way worshippers are called to the Torah, offering Mebiat, Hebrew for from the house of, in addition to the traditional, son of, or, daughter of. In 2003 the female face of God in Auschwitz, a Jewish feminist theology of the Holocaust, the first full-length feminist theology of the Holocaust, written by Melissa Raphael, was published. Judith Plaskow's Standing Again at Sinai, Judaism from a Feminist Perspective 1991, and Rachel Adler's Engendering Judaism, an Inclusive Theology and Ethics 1999 are the only two full-length Jewish feminist works to focus entirely on theology in general rather than specific aspects such as Holocaust theology. Thus, Standing Again at Sinai, Judaism from a Feminist Perspective 1991 is the first book of Jewish feminist theology ever written. There is a growing subfield in the study of gender and Judaism, which sees the binaries of male and female as crucial constructs in Jewish thought, while the male-female dialectic first makes its appearance in the story of creation. The Talmud insists that the idea of male and female extends way beyond sex roles. Everything that God created, he created as male and female. Baba Batra 74b this dialectic takes on even greater theological significance in light of the biblical book, Song of Songs, which has been traditionally interpreted as a metaphor for the relationship between God and the nation of Israel, where the nation of Israel is cast as feminine towards God, who is represented in the story by the male lover. Other examples of topics in which the male-female dynamic is used metaphorically include, the relationship between Shabbat and the days of the week eight, the relationship between the oral and written law, the relationship between this world and the next, the interplay between the legal and extra-legal aspects of Talmud halacha and, nine, and the Jewish calendar, which makes use of both the sun traditionally symbolic of the male force and the moon traditionally symbolic of the female force. Gender polarity is robustly maintained in both the Bible and in the the oral law, Deuteronomy, 22-5, even forbids cross-dressing and upholding this polarity is seen as critical in achieving synthesis between the masculine and feminine. This exploration of gender constructs in primary sources reveals surprising valuation of the feminine prototype in Kabbalah-based sources which invites inquiry into the social, ethical, ecological, moral and philosophical ramifications of a feminine perspective within Jewish thought. Topic. Orthodox Judaism Topic. Haredi positions on feminism The leaders of Haredi Judaism regularly pronounce all forms of feminism as reform, as non-Jewish, or as a threat to Jewish tradition. An article in Cross Currents criticizing advancing women's leadership writes that the entirety of traditional Jewish religious life, including its age-old ritual norms and societal norms, even if they lack formal codification, reflects Torah values, be they halachic or hashkafic. Every aspect of our multi-millennia traditional religious communal modality is embedded in or predicated upon halachic or hashkafic axioms. These axioms may not be apparent to the uninitiated, yet failure to perceive them does not grant license to negate, dismiss or reform." The Haredi claim is that feminism is changing Torah. Haredi Judaism also espouses strict essentialist differences between men and women, rooted in ideas about God's will and creation. 
The Haredi worldview espouses the idea of womanhood as expressed in King Solomon's poem, A Woman of Valor, which praises a woman for maintaining the home, care for the family, and food preparation, practices which the poem admire in women as part of their wisdom, courage, creativity, dedication, selflessness, and perhaps business acumen. The most important thrust of Haredi education for girls and young women is to educate, train, and encourage them to become wives and mothers within large families devoted to the strictest Torah Judaism way of life. While most Haredi women receive schooling in BEI's Yaakov schools designed for them exclusively, the curriculum of these schools does not teach Talmud and neither encourages nor teaches its female students to study the same subjects as young Haredi men in the Haredi yeshivas. In some Haredi communities, the education of girls in secular subjects such as mathematics is superior to that of boys. This is partly because of the greater time devoted to sacred subjects in the case of boys, and partly because many Haredi women work in paid jobs to enable their husbands to engage in full-time Torah study or to bring in a second income. There is currently no movement within Haredi Judaism to train women as rabbis, and there is no visible movement to advance women's Talmudic knowledge. In the fall of 2015, the Agudath Israel of America, which is part of Haredi Judaism, denounced moves to ordain women, and went even further, declaring Yeshivat Maharat, Yeshivat Chovive Torah, Open Orthodoxy, and other affiliated entities to be similar to other dissident movements throughout Jewish history in having rejected basic tenets of Judaism. Nevertheless, most Haredi women are exposed to modern ideas and secular education, unlike most Haredi men. Professor Tamar L. or explored changes in women's lives and the impact of mixed educational cultures on women's empowerment in her seminal book, Educated and Ignorant about the Education of Women in the Gur Hasidic Community. However, in 2016 it was learned that the Satmar sect issued a decree warning that university education for women was dangerous. Written in Yiddish, the decree warned, it has lately become the new trend that girls and married women are pursuing degrees in special education. Some attend classes and others online. And so we'd like to let their parents know that it is against the Torah. We will be very strict about this. No girls attending our school are allowed to study and get a degree. It is dangerous. Girls who will not abide will be forced to leave our school. Also, we will not give any jobs or teaching position in the school to girls who've been to college or have a degree. We have to keep our school safe and we can't allow any secular influences in our holy environment. It is against the base upon which our most was built. There are some signs of a feminist movement beginning to sprout in the Haredi world, especially in Israel. During the 2013 Israeli elections, Esti Shushan led a feminist drive to force Haredi political parties to allow women to run on their lists. The parties currently forbid women from running. The campaign called on Haredi women to refuse to vote for parties that exclude women. In addition, during the 2013 municipal elections in Israel, three Haredi women took an unprecedented step and ran for their local municipalities Shira Gergi in Safed, Ruth Kolian in Pedak Tikva, and Racheli Ibenboim in Jerusalem. Gergi is the only one who was elected, becoming the first Haredi woman to sit on a municipal council, and becoming the first woman on the Safed council in 20 years. One of the most interesting voices of Haredi feminism is that of Adina Bar Shalom, daughter of the late Israeli Sephardic chief Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. Bar Shalom established the Haredi College of Jerusalem, regularly speaks out about the importance of women's education and work, and in 2013 established a women's only political party in the Haredi town of Alad. In addition, in early 2014 she considered a bid to become the president of Israel. In March 2014, Bar Shalom wrote that the Haredi feminist revolution is already here. The train has left the station. She wrote, another emerging Haredi voice is that of Esti Reader Indorsky. She came out in March 2014 as a popular Haredi columnist who had been writing under a man's name, Ari Solomon, and has a large following under her pseudonym. In an article in Enet, Reader Indorsky claimed that there is a strong feminist movement brewing in the Haredi community, and asked non-Haredi women to stay out of their own internal revolution. Don't patronize us, she writes to non-Haredi feminists. Don't make revolutions for us, or try to clean out our backyard. We are doing it in our own way and we are doing it better. There is an abundance of Haredi women lawyers and women in startup. There are Haredi women who choose an academic career, and there are Haredi women leading change in every area imaginable. The change will happen. It's already happening. 
These are signs of the beginnings of feminist movement in the Haredi community in Israel. Non-Haredi Orthodox Jewish feminism Orthodox Jewish feminism, unlike its Reform, Reconstructionist counterparts, seeks to change the position of women from within Jewish law Orthodox feminism works within the halakhic system and works with rabbis and rabbinical institutions to create more inclusive practices within Orthodox communal life and leadership. Orthodox feminism tends to focus on issues, such as the problems of aguna, fostering women's education, leadership, and ritual participation, women's leadership and making synagogue more women-friendly. Unlike other denominations, Orthodox feminists retain the partition in synagogue and do not count women in a minyan. The all-women's prayer group, Women's Tefillah Group is an orthodox practice that began in the 1970s and continues today. New educational programs have enabled modern orthodox women to study Talmud and other rabbinic literature at levels intended to be comparable to a yeshiva or kollel for men, including Drisha Institute founded in 1979, Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies, and Matan Women's Institute for Torah Studies. In 1997, Blue Greenberg founded the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance (JOFA) to advocate for women's increased part participation and leadership in modern Orthodox Jewish life and to create a community for women and men dedicated to such change. Jofa has focused on issues including, aguna, bat mitzvah, women's scholarship, women's prayer, ritual, women's synagogue leadership, and women's religious leadership. Also in 1997, Gail Billig became the first female president of a major Orthodox synagogue, at Congregation Ahavath Torah in Englewood, NJ in 2002. The first partnership minyans were established Shira Hadasha in Jerusalem, and Darke Nome in New York City. These are Orthodox communities that maximize women's participation in the prayer to the full extent possible within Halakha. Although critics of partnership minyan argue that these are not Orthodox. The communities themselves vehemently insist that they are orthodox. The fact that the synagogues have partitions and do not count women as part of the minyan and thus do not allow women to lead any parts of services that require a quorum demonstrate the loyalty to orthodox practice. Dr. Alana Stockman, former executive director of Jofa, wrote extensively about this phenomenon in her book The Men's Section, Orthodox Jewish Men in an Egalitarian World, and examined this dynamic in which the partnership Minyan considers itself orthodox but is often rejected as orthodox by other members of the community. Today there are over 35 partnership minyans around the world. Another major historical event of orthodox feminism occurred in 2009 when Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz became the first publicly ordained orthodox woman rabbi. Avi Weiss then launched a training school for orthodox women in rabbinic positions, Yeshivat Maharat, acronym for Mora Hilkhetit Rabbani Tiranit. A rabbinic halakhic Torah teacher, Rabbi Weiss had originally announced that graduates would be called rabbi but when the Rabbinical Council of America threatened to oust him, he recanted and created the term Maharat. The first cohort of Maharats graduated in June 2013, Maharats Ruth Belinsky Friedman, Rachel Cole Feingold and Abby Brown Shire. In 2015 Yaffa Epstein was ordained as rabbi by the Yeshivat Maharat. Also that year Lila Kagadan was ordained as rabbi by the Yeshivat Maharat, making her their first graduate to take the title rabbi. In January 2013 Tamar Frankiel became the president of the Academy for Jewish Religion in California, making her the first Orthodox woman to lead an American rabbinical school. The school itself is transdenominational, not Orthodox. In 2013, the Israeli Orthodox rabbinical organization Beit Hillel issued a halachic ruling which allows women, for the first time, to say the Kaddish prayer in memory of their deceased parents. Also in 2013, the first class of female halachic advisors trained to practice in the U.S. graduated. They graduated from the North American branch of Nishmat's Yotzit Halacha program in a ceremony at Congregation Shirdith Israel, Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Manhattan. However, this event was met with only faint enthusiasm among Orthodox feminists for several reasons. One is that Nishmat consistently distances itself from feminism, as its founder Chana Henkin often pronounces that she is not a feminist and that the women who graduate from Nishmat do not adjudicate halakha but always ask male rabbis. Another reason is that against the backdrop of the graduation of women from Yeshivat Maharat, in which women are full leaders with complete authority to adjudicate and function as communal rabbis this event does not necessarily represent the greatest advancement for Orthodox women and is arguably a step backward. 
That is, women counseling women only on women's issues without any real halakhic authority of their own keeps women in a somewhat more official version of traditional gender roles. In 2014, the first women were elected as national officers of the Orthodox Union, specifically, three female national vice presidents and two female associate vice presidents were elected. In June 2015, Lila Kagadan was ordained by Yeshivat Maharat and, in keeping with newer policies, was given the freedom to choose her own title, and she chose to be addressed as rabbi. In 2015, Rabbi Kagadan completed a residency at Shira Hadasha in Australia. However, in the fall of 2015, the Rabbinical Council of America, representing over a thousand Orthodox rabbis across the United States, formally adopted a policy prohibiting the ordination or hiring of women rabbis by synagogues that operate within the boundaries of their figurative jurisdiction, regardless of title. Also in 2015, the Israeli Orthodox rabbinical organization Beit Hillel issued a ruling which allows women to give instruction on Jewish law and to issue halachic decisions. Beit Hillel claimed that this ruling was the first time women issuing halachic rulings was formally affirmed in a written responsa of Jewish law. Also in 2015, Jenny Rosenfeld became the first female Orthodox spiritual advisor in Israel specifically, she became the spiritual advisor, also called Manhiga Rukanit, for the community of Efrat. Also in 2015, the first Israeli political party dedicated to ultra-Orthodox women was unveiled, called Bazutan, Haredi Women Making Change. In 2016 it was announced that Ephraim Mervis created the job of Mayan by which women would be advisors on Jewish law in the area of family purity and as adult educators in Orthodox synagogues. This requires a part-time training course for 18 months, which is the first such course in the United Kingdom. In 2017, the Orthodox Union adopted a policy banning women from serving as clergy, from holding titles such as rabbi or from doing common clergy functions even without a title, in its congregations in the United States. <laughs> Women in Jewish religious law, clergy, schools, groups, and rituals In 1845, rabbis attending the Frankfurt Synod of the Emerging Reform Judaism declared women count in a minyan, a formalization of a customary reform practice dating back to 1811. In 1854, Fanny Nuda wrote the first Jewish prayer book known to have been written by a woman for women, called Hours of Devotion. It was translated into English and published in the United States twelve years later. In 2015, a plaque honoring her was unveiled in Lostis, where she lived while her husband was a rabbi there. In 1884, Julie Rosewald became America's first female cantor, though she was born in Germany. She served San Francisco's Temple Emmanuel, although she was not ordained. She served as a cantor there until 1893. On the 14th of September 1890, Ray Frank gave the Rosh Hashanah sermon for a community in Spokane, Washington, thus becoming the first woman to preach from a synagogue pulpit. Although she was not a rabbi, on the 18th of March 1922, the American rabbi Mordecai M. Kaplan held the first public celebration of a bat mitzvah in the United States for his daughter Judith at the Society for the Advancement of Judaism, his synagogue in New York City. Judith Kaplan recited the preliminary blessing, read a portion of that week's Torah portion in Hebrew and English, and then intoned the closing blessing. Kaplan, who at that time claimed to be an Orthodox rabbi, joined conservative Judaism and then became the founder of Reconstructionist Judaism, and influenced Jews from all branches of non-Orthodox Judaism through his position at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Also in 1922, Martha Newmark and her father attended the Central Conference of American Rabbis Conference, where she succeeded in convincing the CCAR to ordain women rabbis. The CCAR declared in a responsa in 1922, "...woman cannot justly be denied the privilege of ordination," having voted 56 to 11 in favor of that statement. Yet the board of the college still refused to consider women for ordination, voting, as Newmark recalled, six laymen to two rabbis against it. Newmark thus earned a qualification as a religious school principal instead of ordination, though she had spent seven and a half years in rabbinical school. Also in 1922, Irma Lindheim entered the Jewish Institute of Religion in New York City, though she eventually left for the greater cause of Zionism. 
While there, in 1923, she petitioned the faculty to change her status from that of special student to a regular student in the rabbinic program. In response, in May of that year, they unanimously recommended the admission of women to the institute on the same basis as men. In 1935, Regina Jonas became the first formally ordained female rabbi. She was ordained by the liberal rabbi Max Dienmann, who was the head of the Liberal Rabbis Association, in Offenbach am Main, Germany. In 1939, Helen Leventhal became the first American. American woman to complete the entire course of study in a rabbinical school, which she did at the Jewish Institute of Religion in New York. Her thesis was on women's suffrage from the point of view of Jewish law. However, she only received a Master of Hebrew Letters and a certificate recognizing her accomplishment upon graduation, rather than a Master of Hebrew Letters and ordination as the men received, since the faculty felt it was not yet time for women's ordination as rabbis. In 1955, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards of Conservative Judaism declared that women were eligible to chant the blessings before and after the reading of the Torah. In the late 1960s, the first Orthodox Jewish women's Tefla prayer group was created, on the holiday of Simit Torah at Lincoln Square Synagogue in Manhattan. In 1973, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards passed a Takana ruling allowing women to count in a minyan equally with men. Also in 1973, the United Synagogue of America, Conservative Judaism's Congregational Association now called the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism resolved to allow women to participate in synagogue rituals and to promote equal opportunity for women for positions of leadership, authority, and responsibility in congregational life. In 1974, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards adopted a series of proposals that equalized men and women in all areas of ritual, including serving as prayer leaders. In 1972, Sally Presand became America's first female rabbi ordained by a rabbinical seminary, and the second formally ordained female rabbi. After Regina Jonas, Presand was ordained by the Reform Jewish Seminary Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion on 3 June 1972, at the Plum Street Temple in Cincinnati. Also in 1972, a group of ten New York Jewish feminists calling themselves Ezret Nashim the women's section in a synagogue, but also, women's help, took the issue of equality for women to the 1972 convention of the conservative movement's rabbinical assembly, presenting a document on 14 March that they named the Call for Change. The rabbis received the document in their convention packets, but Ezret Nashim presented it during a meeting with the rabbis' wives. The call for change demanded that women be accepted as witnesses before Jewish law, be considered as bound to perform all mitzvah, be allowed full participation in religious observances, have equal rights in marriage and be allowed to initiate divorce, be counted in the minyan, and be permitted to assume positions of leadership in the synagogue and within the general Jewish community. Paula Hyman, who was a member of Ezra Nashim, wrote that we recognized that the subordinate status of women was linked to their exemption from positive time-bound mitzvah commandments, and we therefore accepted increased obligation as the corollary of equality." In 1973, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards of Conservative Judaism voted to count men and women equally as members of a minyan. In 1974 Sandy Eisenberg Sasso became the first female rabbi ordained in Reconstructionist Judaism. In 1975, Barbara Ostfeld Horowitz became the first female cantor ordained in Reform Judaism. In 1976, the first women-only Passover Seder was held in Esther M. Broner's New York City apartment and led by her, with 13 women attending, including Gloria Steinem, Letty Cotton Pogrebin, and Phyllis Chesler. Esther Broner and Naomi Nimrod created a women's Haggadah for use at this Seder. In the spring of 1976 Esther Broner published this, Women's Haggadah, in Ms. Magazine, later publishing it as a book in 1994. This Haggadah is meant to include women where only men had been mentioned in traditional Haggadahs, and it features the wise women, the four daughters, the women's questions, the women's plagues, and a women-centric, Dayenu. The original women's Seder has been held with the women's Haggadah every year since 1976, and women-only Seders are now held by some congregations as well. Some Seders including the original women's Seder, but not limited to women-only Seders now set out a cup for the Prophet Miriam as well as the traditional cup for the Prophet Elijah, sometimes accompanied by a ritual to honor Miriam. Miriam's cup originated in the 1980s in a Boston Rosh Hodesh group. It was invented by Stephanie Liu, who filled it with Mayim Hayim living waters and used it in a feminist ceremony of guided meditation. Miriam's cup is linked to the Midrash of Miriam's well, which 
is a rabbinic legend that tells of a miraculous well that accompanied the Israelites during their forty years in the desert at the exodus from Egypt." Furthermore, some Jews include an orange on the Seder plate. The orange represents the fruitfulness for all Jews when all marginalized peoples are included, particularly women and gay people. An incorrect but common rumor says that this tradition began when a man told Susanna Heschel that a woman belongs on the bima as an orange on the Seder plate, however, it actually began when in the early 1980s, while when speaking at Oberlin College Hillel, Susanna Heschel was introduced to an early feminist Haggadah that suggested adding a crust of bread on the Seder plate, as a sign of solidarity with Jewish lesbians as some would say there's as much room for a lesbian in Judaism as there is for a crust of bread on the Seder plate. Heschel felt that to put bread on the Seder plate would be to accept that Jewish lesbians and gay men violate Judaism like Hametz violates Passover. So, at her next Seder, she chose an orange as a symbol of inclusion of gays and lesbians and others who are marginalized within the Jewish community. In addition, each orange segment had a few seeds that had to be spit out. A gesture of spitting out and repudiating the homophobia of traditional Judaism. In 1978, Linda Rich became the first female cantor to sing in a conservative synagogue, specifically Temple Beth Zion in Los Angeles, although she was not ordained. In 1979, Linda Joy Holtzman was hired by Beth Israel Congregation of Chester County, which was then located in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. She had graduated in 1979 from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in Philadelphia, yet was hired by Beth Israel despite there being a conservative congregation. Holtzman was thus the first woman to serve as a rabbi for a solely conservative congregation, as the conservative movement did not then ordain women. However, Sandy Eisenberg Sasso served as rabbi along with her husband at the congregation Beth El Zedek in Indianapolis from 1977 until 2013. Beth El Zedek is identified with both the Reconstructionist and Conservative movements. In 1981, the Jewish feminist group, Banat Esh, Hebrew for Daughters of Fire, was founded. As of 2011, this group meets for five days every year over Memorial Day weekend at the Grail, a Catholic laywoman's retreat center in Cornwall on Hudson, New York. There they, to quote Merle Feld, one of their members, "...explore issues of spirituality, social change, and the feminist transformation of Judaism." Also in 1981, Lynn Gottlieb became the first female rabbi ordained in Jewish renewal. In 1983, the Jewish Theological Seminary (JTS), the main educational institution of the conservative movement, voted without accompanying opinion to ordain women as rabbis and as cantors. Paula Hyman, among others, took part in the vote as a member of the JTS faculty. There had been a special commission appointed by the conservative movement to study the issue of ordaining women as rabbis, which met between 1977 and 1978, and consisted of 11 men and three women. The women were Marion Siner Gordon, an attorney, Rivka Harris, an Assyriologist, and Francine Klagsbrunn, a writer. Amy Eilberg became the first female rabbi ordained in conservative Judaism in 1985. In 1987, Erica Lipitz and Marla Rosenfeld Barugal became the first female cantors ordained in conservative Judaism. However, the Cantors Assembly, a professional organization of cantors associated with conservative Judaism, did not allow women to join until 1990. In 1997, Gail Billig became the first female president of a major Orthodox synagogue, at Congregation Ahavath Torah in Englewood, NJ. In 1999, Tamara Colton became the very first rabbi, and therefore, since she was female, the first female rabbi ordained in humanistic Judaism. In 2001 Deborah Davis became the first cantor of either sex and therefore, since she was female, the first female cantor ordained in humanistic Judaism. However, humanistic Judaism has since stopped graduating cantors. In 2002, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards of Conservative Judaism adapted a responsum by Rabbi David Fine, Women and the Minyan, which provides an official religious law foundation for counting women in a minyan and explains the current conservative approach to the role of women in prayer. This responsum holds that although Jewish women do not traditionally have the same obligations as men, conservative women have, as a collective whole, voluntarily undertaken them. Because of this collective undertaking, the fine responsum holds that conservative women are eligible to serve as agents and decision makers for others. The responsum also holds that traditionally minded communities and individual women can opt out without being regarded by the conservative movement as sinning. 
By adopting this responsum, the CJLS found itself in a position to provide a considered Jewish law justification for its egalitarian practices, without having to rely on potentially unconvincing arguments, undermine the religious importance of community and clergy, ask individual women intrusive questions, repudiate the halakhic tradition, or label women following traditional practices as sinners. Also in 2002, Sharon Hordes became the first cantor of either sex and therefore, since she was female, the first female cantor ordained in Reconstructionist Judaism. Also in 2002, Avital Gerstitter, who lived in Germany, became the first female cantor ordained in Jewish renewal and the first female cantor in Germany. In 2005, the Kohené Institute was founded by Rabbi Jill Hammer and Holly Scher. The Kohené Institute, based at the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center in Connecticut, offers a two-year course of study to women who are then ordained as Jewish priestesses. Kohené is a feminine variation on Kohan, meaning priest. The Kohené Institute's training involves earth-based spiritual practices that they believe harken back to pre-Rabbinic Judaism, a time when, according to Kohené's founders, women took on many more and much more powerful spiritual leadership roles than are commonly taken by women today. A Jewish priestess may, according to Kohené, act as a rabbi, but the two roles are not the same. In 2006, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards of Conservative Judaism adopted three responsa on the subject of nidda, which reaffirmed an obligation of conservative women to abstain from sexual relations during and following menstruation and to immerse in a mikvah prior to resumption, while liberalizing observance requirements including shortening the length of the nidda period, lifting restrictions on non-sexual contact during nidda, and reducing the circumstances under which spotting and similar conditions would mandate abstinence. Also in 2006, Susan Welly became the first American female cantor ordained in Jewish renewal, however, she died in 2009. In June 2009, Avi Weiss ordained Sarah Hurwitz with the title, Maharat, an acronym of Manhiga Hilkhetit Rukhat Taranit, rather than Rabbi. In February 2010, Weiss announced that he was changing Maharat to a more familiar sounding title, Rabbi. The goal of this shift was to clarify Hurwitz's position as a full member of the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale Rabbinic Staff. The change was criticized by both Agudath Yisrael and the Rabbinical Council of America, who called the move, "...beyond the pale of Orthodox Judaism." Weiss announced amidst criticism that the term, "...rabba," would not be used anymore for his future students. Hurwitz will continue to use the title rabba and is considered by some to be the first female Orthodox rabbi. However Weiss said other graduates of Yeshivat Maharat, which he founded, would not receive the rabbi title, but the Maharat Smicha. But in 2015 Yaffa Epstein was ordained as rabbi by the Yeshivat Maharat. Also in 2015, Lila Kagadan was ordained as rabbi by that same organization, making her their first graduate to take the title rabbi. Also in 2009, Tanoz Baraman Foruzanfar, who was born in Iran, became the first Persian woman to be ordained as a cantor in the United States. Also in 2009, Alyssa Stanton became the first African American woman ordained as a rabbi. In 2010, the first American women to be ordained as cantors in Jewish renewal after Susan Welly's ordination, Michal Rubin and Abby Lyons, were both ordained. In January 2013, Tamar Frankiel became the president of the Academy for Jewish Religion in California, making her the first Orthodox woman to lead an American rabbinical school. The school itself is transdenominational, not Orthodox. In 2013, Malka Shapps became the first female Haredi dean at an Israeli university when she was appointed dean of Bar Ilan University's Faculty of Exact Sciences. In 2013, the Israeli Orthodox rabbinical organization Beit Hillel issued a Halashik ruling which allows women, for the first time, to say the Kaddish prayer in memory of their deceased parents. In 2013, Saudi Rial's High School in Riverdale, New York began allowing girls to wrap to fill in during Shacharit morning prayer, it is probably the first modern Orthodox high school in the U.S. to do so. On 26 October 2014 Rabbi Deborah Waxman was inaugurated as the president of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College and Jewish Reconstructionist Communities. Waxman is believed to be the first woman rabbi and first lesbian to lead a Jewish congregational union, and the first woman and first lesbian to lead a Jewish seminary. The Reconstructionist Rabbinical College is both a congregational union and a seminary. In 2014, the first ever book of Halashik decisions written by women who were ordained to serve as Poskim, Idit Bartov, and Anat Novoselsky was published. 
The women were ordained by the municipal chief rabbi of Efrat, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, after completing Midrashat Lindenbaum Women's College's five-year ordination course in advanced studies in Jewish law, as well as passing examinations equivalent to the rabbinate's requirement for men. In 2014, Dr. Michelle Friedman became the first woman on the Beth Din of America's Board of Directors. In 2014, the first women were elected as national officers of the Orthodox Union, specifically, three female national vice presidents and two female associate vice presidents were elected. In June 2015, Lila Kagadan was ordained by Yeshivat Maharat and in keeping with newer policies, was given the freedom to choose her own title, and she chose to be addressed as Rabbi. However, in the fall of 2015, the Rabbinical Council of America, representing over a thousand Orthodox rabbis across the United States, formally adopted a policy prohibiting the ordination or hiring of women rabbis by synagogues that operate within the boundaries of their figurative jurisdiction, regardless of title. Similarly, in the fall of 2015, the Agudath Israel of America denounced moves to ordain women, and went even further, declaring Yeshivat Maharat, Yeshivat Chovive Torah, Open Orthodoxy, and other affiliated entities to be similar to other dissident movements throughout Jewish history in having rejected basic tenets of Judaism. Also in 2015 the Israeli Orthodox rabbinical organization Beit Hillel issued a ruling which allows women to give instruction on Jewish law and to issue halachic decisions. Beit Hillel claimed that this ruling was the first time women issuing halachic rulings was formally affirmed in a written responsa of Jewish law. Also in 2015, Jenny Rosenfeld became the first female Orthodox spiritual advisor in Israel. Specifically, she became the spiritual advisor, also called Manhiga Rukanit, for the community of Efrat. Also in 2015, Daryl Messenger became the first female chair of the Union for Reform Judaism. In 2016, after four years of deliberation, the Reform Seminary H. HUCJIR decided to give women a choice of wording on their ordination certificates, including the option to have the same wording as men. Up until then, male candidate certificates identified them by the reform movement's traditional Moranu Harav, or Our Teacher the Rabbi, while female candidate certificates only used the term Rav Umora, or Rabbi and Teacher. Rabbi Mary Zamor, executive director of the Reform Movement's Women's Rabbinic Network, explained that the HUC was uncomfortable with giving women the same title as men. In 2012 she wrote to Rabbi David Ellinson, HUC's then president, requesting that he address the discrepancy, which she said was, "...smacking of gender inequality." <laughs> <laughs> Women as Sofro scribes. A sofer, sofer, sofer setem, or sofer street. M. Heb. Scribe. Sweepyar Stem is a Jewish scribe who can transcribe Torah scrolls, tefillin and mezuzo, and other religious writings. Street. M. Stem is an abbreviation for Sefer Torahs, tefillin, and mezuzo. The plural of sofer is soferim. Sauprim forming the basis for the discussion of women becoming soferim, Talmud Gittin 45b states. Cipher a Torah, tefillin and mezuzo written by a heretic, a star worshipper, a slave, a woman, a minor, a Cuthian, or an apostate Jew, are unfit for ritual use. The rulings on mezuzah and tefillin are virtually undisputed among those who hold to the Talmudic law. While Arba Aturim does not include women in its list of those ineligible to write Cipher a Torah, some see this as proof that women are permitted to write a Torah scroll. However today, virtually all Orthodox both modern and ultra authorities contest the idea that a woman is permitted to write a Sefer Torah. Yet women are permitted to inscribe ketubot marriage contracts, stam not intended for ritual use, and other writings of Sofrit beyond simple stam. In 2003 Canadian Aviel Barclay became the world's first known traditionally trained female Sofer. In 2007 Jen Taylor Friedman, a British woman, became the first female sofer to scribe a Sefer Torah. In 2010 the first Sefer Torah scribed by a group of women six female sofers, who were from Brazil, Canada, Israel, and the United States was completed, this was known as the Women's Torah Project. From October 2010 until spring 2011, Julie Seltzer, one of the female sofro from the Women's Torah Project, scribed a Sefer Torah as part of an exhibition at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. This makes her the first American female sofer to scribe a Sefer Torah. Julie Seltzer was born in Philadelphia and is non-denominationally Jewish. 
From spring 2011 until August 2012 she scribed another Sefer Torah, this time for the Reform Congregation Beth Israel in San Diego. Seltzer was taught mostly by Jen Taylor Friedman. On the 22nd of September 2013, Congregation Beth Elohim of New York dedicated a new Torah, which members of Beth Elohim said was the first Torah in New York City to be completed by a woman. The Torah was scribed by Linda Koppelson. As of 2014, there are an estimated 20 female sofers in the world. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Women in Humanistic Judaism. Humanistic Judaism is a movement in Judaism that offers a non-theistic alternative in contemporary Jewish life. It defines Judaism as the cultural and historical experience of the Jewish people and encourages humanistic and secular Jews to celebrate their Jewish identity by participating in Jewish holidays and life cycle events such as weddings and bar and bat mitzvah with inspirational ceremonies that draw upon but go beyond traditional literature. Humanistic Judaism ordains both men and women as rabbis, and its first rabbi was a woman, Tamara Colton, who was ordained in 1999. Its first cantor was also a woman, Deborah Davis, ordained in 2001. However, Humanistic Judaism has since stopped ordaining cantors. The Society for Humanistic Judaism issued a statement in 1996 stating in part, we affirm that a woman has the moral right and should have the continuing legal right to decide whether or not to terminate a pregnancy in accordance with her own ethical standards. Because a decision to terminate a pregnancy carries serious, irreversible consequences, it is one to be made with great care and with keen awareness of the complex psychological, emotional, and ethical implications." They also issued a statement in 2011 condemning the then-recent passage of the no Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act", by the U.S. House of Representatives, which they called, "...a direct attack on a woman's right to choose". In 2012 they issued a resolution opposing conscience clauses that allow religious-affiliated institutions to be exempt from generally applicable requirements mandating reproductive health care services to individuals or employees. In 2013 they issued a resolution stating in part, Therefore, be it resolved that, the Society for Humanistic Judaism wholeheartedly supports the observance of Women's Equality Day on August 26 to commemorate the anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution allowing women to vote. The Society condemns gender discrimination in all its forms, including restriction of rights, limited access to education, violence, and subjugation, and the Society commits itself to maintain vigilance and speak out in the fight to bring gender equality to our generation and to the generations that follow. Israel In 1947 David Ben-Gurion agreed that the authority in matters of marriage and divorce would be invested in the hands of the chief rabbinate of Israel, and an agreement was signed stating that, among other matters, known as the status quo letter. In 1953 the Knesset enacted the Rabbinical Court's Jurisdiction Marriage and Divorce Law, 5713-1953. Section 1 of the law states, "...matters of marriage and divorce of Jews in Israel, being citizens or residents of the state, shall be under the exclusive jurisdiction of the Rabbinical Courts." The substantive provision of Section 2 of this law further states, Marriages and divorces of Jews shall be performed in Israel in accordance with Jewish religious law. Din Torah. However, a Muslim woman in Israel may petition for and receive a divorce through the Sharia courts without her husband's consent under certain conditions, and a marriage contract may provide for other circumstances in which she may obtain a divorce without her husband's consent. A Muslim man in Israel may divorce his wife without her consent and without petitioning the court. Christians in Israel may seek official separations or divorces, depending on the denomination, through ecclesiastical courts. In 2006, Israel's Supreme Court ruled that women should be allowed to deliver eulogies and that the burial societies, or Chevra Kaddisha, should not impose gender segregation in the cemetery. The ruling was in response to an incident in Petak Tikva in which a woman was stopped from eulogizing her father. 
However, the court's ruling was not backed up by the Religious Services Ministry until 2012, when Israel's chief rabbinical council ruled that women can deliver eulogies at funerals, but that it is up to the community rabbi to decide on a case by case basis. In 2010, Israel passed the civil union law, allowing a couple to marry civilly in Israel if they are both registered as officially not belonging to any religion. On 28 September 2010, the Israeli Supreme Court outlawed public gender segregation in Jerusalem's Mea Sharif neighborhood in response to a petition submitted after extremist Haredi men physically and verbally assaulted women for walking on a designated men's only road. However, in January 2011, a ruling of the Israeli High Court of Justice allowed the continuation of the gender segregation in public buses on a strictly voluntary basis for a one year experimental period. In 2013, the Israeli Orthodox rabbinical organization Beit Hillel issued a Halashik ruling which allows women, for the first time, to say the Kaddish prayer in memory of their deceased parents. Also in 2013, the minimum marriage age in Israel became 18 for females and males. Also in 2013, the religious judges' law in Israel was amended to say that at least four women must be included in the religious judges' nomination committee, including a female advocate in the religious courts, and that the total number of committee members shall be eleven. Also in 2013, Israel's chief rabbinate promised to remove the obstacles preventing women from working as supervisors in the state kosher certification system, and Amuna announced the first supervisor certification course for women in Israel. Also in 2013, the Minister of Religious Affairs and Chief Chief rabbis issued statements telling ritual bath attendants only to inspect women who want inspection, putting an end to forced inspections of women at mikvahs. In May 2013, after Women of the Wall, led by Anat Hoffman, had engaged in civil disobedience to exercise freedom of religion, a judge ruled that a 2003 Israeli Supreme Court ruling prohibiting women from carrying a Torah or wearing prayer shawls at the Western Wall had been misinterpreted and that Women of the Wall prayer gatherings at the Western Wall should not be deemed illegal. In October 2014 Women of the Wall smuggled in a Torah scroll to the Western Wall Women's Section and held their first Torah reading by a woman at the site, which was part of the Bat Mitzvah of Sasha Lut. However, Shmuel Rabinowitz, the rabbi of the Western Wall, issued a statement saying in part, "...in future, efforts will be made to ensure that this does not happen again, and the introduction of Torah scrolls will be banned for everyone, men and women." In December 2014 some of the women of the wall became the first women to light menorahs at the Western Wall. Specifically, they lit 28 menorahs in the women's section of the wall. Sarah Silverman was among those who attended the lighting of the menorahs. However, this event came after the rabbi in charge of the Western Wall had refused a request from Women of the Wall to place a menorah in the women's section. In 2015, the first Israeli political party dedicated to ultra Orthodox women was unveiled, called Bazutan, Haredi Women Making Change. Also in 2015, T. Zohar, a religious Zionist rabbinic organization in Israel, along with the Israeli Bar Association, introduced a prenuptial agreement meant to help ensure divorcing wives will receive a get. Under the agreement, the husband commits to paying a high sum of money daily to his spouse in the event of a separation. In 2016, it was announced that the High Court of Justice had given the Justice Ministry 30 days to formulate new regulations to allow women to compete compete equally with men for the position of director of rabbinical courts also in 2016 in a groundbreaking ruling the tel aviv rabbinical court ordered a man jailed for 30 days for helping his son refuse to give his daughter in law a divorce for 11 years also in 2016 karmit faintik became the first woman to be hired as a communal leader at an orthodox synagogue in israel ramban synagogue in january 2017 the israeli high court ruled that if the government of Israel could not find good cause to prohibit women reading from the Torah in prayer services at the Western Wall within 30 days, women could do so. They also ruled that the Israeli government could no longer argue that the Robinson's Arch area of the plaza is access to the Western Wall. <laughs> Aguna Aguna Hebrew, Gwenh plural, Aguno, Gwau literally anchored or chained, is a Halashik term for a Jewish woman who is chained to her marriage. The classic case of this is a man who has left on a journey and has not returned, or has gone into battle and is Mia. It also refers to a woman whose husband refuses, or is unable, to grant her an official Jewish bill of divorce, known as a get. 
The problem of get refusal became more widespread when Jews lived in countries where civil divorce was available, separate from religious divorce. Outside Israel, an aguna could obtain a civil divorce and remarry via civil marriage, as non-Israeli legal systems generally do not recognize the aguna status, but an aguna would not typically pursue a second marriage, since her first marriage is still valid according to Halakha, therefore any other sexual relationships would constitute adultery from her first husband. Furthermore, according to Halakha, any children born by an aguna are considered mamzerim bastards. The earliest prenuptial agreement for the prevention of get refusal was developed and accepted by the Rabbinical Council of Morocco on 16 December 1953. The prenuptial agreement gained further approbation in 1981 from Rabbi Shalom Messes, chief rabbi of Jerusalem. Following Rabbi Messes' involvement, the Rabbinical Council of America actively pursued this issue. The latest in a series of RCA resolutions. That since there is a significant aguna problem in America and throughout the Jewish world, no rabbi should officiate at a wedding where a proper prenuptial agreement on get has not been executed, was passed on 18 May 2006. In 2012, the International Rabbinic Fellowship, IRF, an international organization of, as of 2012, 150 modern Orthodox rabbis, passed a resolution saying that. IRF rabbis may not officiate at a wedding unless the couple has signed a halachic prenuptial agreement. IRF rabbis are further encouraged to participate ritually only in weddings in which the couple has signed a halachic prenuptial agreement. Ritual participation includes but is not limited to reading the ketubah, serving as a witness, and making one of the shiva barakat. This makes the IRF the only orthodox rabbinical organization in the world to require its members to use a halachic prenuptial agreement in any wedding at which they officiate. Beginning in the 1950s, some conservative rabbis have used the Lieberman Clause, named for Talmudic scholar and Jewish Theological Seminary JTS professor Saul Lieberman, in the Ketubah, requiring that a get be granted if a civil divorce is ever issued. Most Orthodox rabbis have rejected the Lieberman Clause, although leaders of the conservative movement claim that the original intent was to find a solution that could be used by Orthodox and conservative rabbis alike, and that leaders of Orthodox Judaism's Rabbinical Council of America, and respected Orthodox rabbis, including Joseph B. Soloveitchik, supposedly recognized the clause as valid. Later, because some civil courts viewed the enforcement of a religious document as a violation of the constitutional principle of the separation of church and state, conservative rabbis began to require couples to sign a separate letter, stating that the clause had been explained to them as part of premarital counseling, and that both parties understood and agreed to its conditions, recognizing that this letter would constitute a separate civil document, enforceable in a civilian court. However, many conservative rabbis, including some on the movement's own law committee, had growing misgivings about the clause for religious reasons. In 1968, by a unanimous vote of the law committee, it was decided that the joint bet din of the conservative movement could annul marriages as a last resort, based on the Talmudic principle of Hofgat Kedushin. According to Rabbi Meir Rabinowitz, the chairman of the joint bet din of the conservative movement, just the threat of this action was sometimes enough to compel the former husband to grant a get. In 1990 Aguna Day was established by ICAR, the International Coalition for Aguna Rights, to raise public awareness of the plight of the Aguna and galvanize action to solve the problem. It is observed on the Jewish calendar date of the Fast of Esther. In 1995 the Israeli parliament gave the rabbinical court expanded legal power to sanction men who refused to give their wives a get by suspending their driver's licenses, seizing their bank accounts, preventing travel abroad and even imprisoning those who do not comply with an order to grant a divorce. However, women's groups say the 1995 law is not very effective because the court uses sanctions in less than 2% of cases. In 2004, Justice Menachem Hakohen of the Jerusalem Family Court offered new hope to Aguno when he ruled that a man refusing his wife a get must pay her NIS 425,000 in punitive damages, because our refusal to grant a get constitutes a severe infringement on her ability to lead a reasonable, normal life, and can be considered emotional abuse lasting several years." He noted that, 
T his is not another sanction against someone refusing to give a get, intended to speed up the process of granting a get, and this court is not involving itself in any future arrangements for the granting of a get, but rather, it is a direct response to the consequences that stem from not granting a get, and the right of the woman to receive punitive damages. This ruling stemmed from the public litigation project initiated by the advocacy organization Center for Women's Justice as one of a number of successful lawsuits filed in Israeli civil courts claiming financial damages against recalcitrant husbands. In 2014, the Rabbinate of Uruguay instituted the requirement for all Jewish couples that marry under its auspices to sign a rabbinic pre nuptial agreement. The agreement states that in the case of the couple divorcing civilly, the husband is obligated to immediately deliver to his wife a get. The initiative was launched by Sarah Vinkovsky, a director of the Kahila, the Comunidad Israelita del Uruguay, Jewish Community of Uruguay, who is also a vice president of the World Jewish Congress and longtime activist for the rights of women within Jewish law. In 2015, T. Zohar, a religious Zionist rabbinic organization in Israel, along with the Israel Bar Association, introduced a prenuptial agreement meant to help ensure divorcing wives will receive a get. Under the agreement, the husband commits to paying a high sum of money daily to his spouse in the event of a separation. In 2018 the Knesset passed a law, slated to remain in effect for three years, allowing Israel's rabbinical courts to handle certain cases of Jewish women wishing to divorce their Jewish husbands, even if neither the wife nor the husband is an Israeli citizen. Topic see also Aguno Feminist Jewish Ethics Gender and Judaism Homosexuality and Judaism Jewish View of Marriage Jewish Women's Archive List of Jewish Feminists Ms. Magazine rejects AJC advertisement honoring three Israeli women Ordination of Women Orthodox Jewish Feminism Partnership Minyan Sexism in Israel Women in Judaism Women of the Wall Topic Notes Topic Further reading Feldman, Emanuel. Orthodox Feminism and Feminist Orthodoxy PDF, 101 kilobytes. Jewish Action, Winter 1999, Girls Just Wanna Be From, Jofa Conference Speaker Says Feminism Lags at Talmud Study Programs in Israel, NY Jewish Week, February 2007. Anita Diamond. Holding Up Half the Sky, Feminist Judaism, Pateo's Jewish Women and the Feminist Revolution, an exhibit of the Jewish Women's Archive, Flash Interactive Site, Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance, Jofa, Adler, Rachel. The Jew Who Wasn't There, Halakha and the Jewish Woman, Davka, 1971. Adler, Rachel. Engendering Judaism, an Inclusive Theology and Ethics. Beacon Press, 1999. Adler, Rachel. Feminist Judaism, Past and Future, Crosscurrents, Winter 2002, Vol. 51, No. 4. Fishman, Sylvia Barak. A Breath of Life, Feminism in the American Jewish Community. Brandeis, 1995. ISBN 0874517060. Greenberg, Blue. Will There Be Orthodox Women Rabbis? Judaism 33.1, Winter 1984, 23-33. Greenberg, Blue. Is Now the Time for Orthodox Women Rabbis? Moment December 1992, 50-53, 74. Gross, Rita. Female God Language in a Jewish Context, Davka, 1976. Hartman, Tova, Feminism Encounters Traditional Judaism, Resistance and Accommodation. Brandeis University Press, 2007. ISBN 1-58465-658-1. Hyman, Paula. The Other Half, Women in the Jewish Tradition, in E. Colton. The Jewish Woman, New Perspectives, Shokin 1976. Hyman, E. Paula and Dash Moore, Deborah, E. D. S. Jewish Women in America, an Historical Encyclopedia. Routledge, ISBN 0-415-91934-7 Hyman, E. Paula and Dahlia Ofer. E. D. S. Jewish Women, a Comprehensive Historical Encyclopedia. Jewish Publication Society C. D. Ram Janowitz, Naomi and Margaret Venick. Sitter Nashim. Self-published, 1976. Levy, Smadar. Mizrahi Feminism and the Question of Palestine, Journal of Middle East Women's Studies. Volume 7 2, 56-88 Nadale, Pamela. Women Who Would Be Rabbis, A History of Women's Ordination, 1889-1985. Beacon Press, 1998. ISBN 0-8070-3649-8. N.E.R. David, Haviva. Life on the Fringes, A Feminist Journey Toward Traditional Rabbinic Ordination. 
Needham, M. A., J. F. L. Books, 2000. Nussbaum Cohen, Deborah. The Women's Movement, Jewish Identity and the Story of a Religion Transformed. The Jewish Week, 17 June 2004 Ozick, Cynthia. Notes Toward Finding the Right Question in Heschel, S. on Being a Jewish Feminist, a Reader. Schocken, 1983. Plaskow, Judith. The Right Question is Theological in Heschel, S. on Being a Jewish Feminist, a Reader, Schocken, 1983. A. Plaskow, Judith. Language, God and Liturgy, A Feminist Perspective, Response 44-3-14, 1983 b. Plaskow, Judith. Standing Again at Sinai, Judaism from a Feminist Perspective, Harper and Rowe, 1990 a. Plaskow, Judith. Beyond Egalitarianism, Ticken 5.6, 79-81, 1990 b. Plaskow, Judith. Facing the Ambiguity of God, Ticken, 6.5, 70-1, 1991. Raphael, Melissa. The Female Face of God in Auschwitz, A Jewish Feminist Theology of the Holocaust. London, Routledge, 2003. Ruttenberg, Dania, ed. Yentl's Revenge, The Next Wave of Jewish Feminism, Seal Press, 2001. Scholten Gutierrez, Melissa. An Ever-Evolving Judaism, Women Meeting the Needs of the Community, Pateos Temin, Ellie. Birthing a Mother, The Surrogate Body and the Pregnant Self, Berkeley, University of California Press, 2010. Amansky, E. and Ashton, D. E. D. S. Four Centuries of Jewish Women's Spirituality, A Sourcebook, Beacon, 1992. Weiss Rosemarin, Trude. The Unfreedom of Jewish Women, originally published in The Jewish Spectator, 1970. Wolowelski, Joel B. Feminism and Orthodox Judaism, Judaism, 188, 47-4, 1998, 499-507.